start in the garden. <coughs> say that's where Friday morning started. What we do know for sure is that for approximately three years, Jesus had traveled around Galilee with uh, his core group of 12 disciples, and he was teaching, preaching, and speaking about the kingdom of God. He started from the, the day of uh, 40 days after his baptism. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Some days for, for those boys were better than others. That, that's the way life is, isn't it? Some days just run a little smoother than other days. Um, there's a story that in one day Jesus was so happy when he, the Father revealed himself to the men as little babes that he jumped for joy. It's the only time that word is used in the New Testament. And it means he literally jumped up and spun around in joy. We've all seen little kids doing that. They get happy, they twirl, and they dance. That was a good day for Jesus. You know he was happy, happy, that the Lord was now speaking directly to his disciples. As parents and grandparents, when we see the Lord speaking directly to our kids, what a day that is. You know that they're getting it. They're getting it. No matter where it happens to be, no matter where I go, they're getting it. They're hearing it. And that's what Jesus was. He was ecstatic that day. Uh, other days are not so good. Like the day Jesus went to his hometown and told him who he was. And the religious leaders, they ran him out of the synagogue. They ran him out of town. In fact, they ran him up on a cliff and tried to push him off. But he vanished him in the midst. i got to believe that was such a good day for Jesus. This is the people he grew up with. Probably some of his kin. Most likely some real close kin, cousins. Maybe it doesn't say, but maybe some of his own brothers and sisters. It was his hometown. It was the people that had seen him grow up. I, you know, that wasn't such a good day for Jesus. Um, but again, that's that's all like this. Some days run smoother than others. Um, so for see, three years, Jesus poured himself into these guys. He's chosen 12. Uh, he'd take them off by themselves. Sometimes he'd just take three or four of them, like the Mount of Transfiguration. That was one for a select few. A lot of times he talked directly just to those 12. Then all the times, obviously, he, he addressed the multitude. So this three years culminated with what we call the Last Supper, the <coughs> Passover meal on Thursday night. Um, John chapters 13 through 17 go into a great bit of detail about this particular evening. This is, uh, again, Thursday night. I'm not in a good Friday yet. Um, you know, you've probably heard the term a, a man's deathbed confessions. You know, if, you, if we got something on our chest and, you know, we know we're dying. There's something we got to say, we're going to say it, that it's been said that not many people lie when they know they're going to die, that the truth comes out. Um, Jesus knew exactly uh, when he was going to die. He... He, he knew he knew the earthly time with his disciples was coming to a close. So that last night he really got down to it. You know, there was there was not uh, I don't want to say any but not near as much talk in parables. He talked plainly and the disciples asked him, speak plainly so we know what you're talking about and he did. He laid things out very clearly. He told him exactly what was going to happen. Uh, he didn't mince any words. He wanted to make sure that these guys got it. Uh, I'd recommend, if you haven't already done so, and even if you have, to uh, read or reread um, those chapters, those five chapters, John 13 through 17. And pray the Lord before you do that He show you. Because uh, there's so much meat in there. So much that we can incorporate into our lives. So many teachings. Um, another good read, there's a little book by a guy named Bruce Wilkerson called Secrets of the Vine. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Wilkerson, if you read that book. It's an excellent, excellent book. God, God's given, given him great insight into chapter 15, and he shares it in that book. 
and he's in my mind spot on. It, uh, it's a, like I said, it's a, it's a good little read. Don't be burned through in a couple hours. I, I encourage you to get it. But you know, for now, we're going to move on in this story and leave the supper and those teachings behind. Um, again, we don't know exactly what was going on at 12 midnight or 12:01. Um, of the beginning of what we call Good Friday, but uh, for this talk, we're going to pick up the reading in the Gospel of Matthew. So I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 26, verse 36. Excuse me, 36 through 44. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to his disciples and found them sleeping. And said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter in temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time he went away and prayed, Father and prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to him, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Arise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. For the sake of this talk, we're going to say that's where Jesus' day started. That that was 1201. For three years, Jesus had traveled around with these guys. Just a few hours earlier, Jesus had humbled himself into the role of the lowest servant and washed their feet. And for the last moments of his earthly freedom, he had told them how much he loved them and that he would never leave them. In clear words. Then, then Jesus, then he gets a phone call. He got that nightly phone call. Bring, bring. Hello? Hey, son. It's time to drink that cup. Uh, so, uh, listen, Dad, is there uh, any other way we can pull this off, uh, this redemption thing? Is there something else uh, we can come up with now? No, son, the penalty for sin is uh, death. And today, you're going to do the dying. Um... Listen, Dad, uh, you know it's, it's not the fear of men or even the physical torments of the cross that had me so sorrowful. It's known the full cup of your divine wrath and fury against sin will mean separation from you. That's why I'm sorrowful. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. Good. good boy. Oh, by the way, those fellows you, you left watching and praying, the very ones you chose out of the world, they're taking a nap. Like up. <laughs> what? <laughs> now, I know Jesus is 100% God. I want you to shout down. And I knew from the, I knew that from the beginning of time, uh, he knew every detail what was going to have this look like. Okay? Um. You know, I used to work with a guy, Chris, you probably remember the same, and we would have a bad day, and uh, he, he'd been in construction a long time, and uh, he'd seen it all, done it all. And if we were having a day where just things were not going, <coughs> just 
just that you had to tear stuff out, rebuild stuff, or the owner was mad, just one of those days. He would smile and say, well, it goes along like this for a while, and then it gets worse. <laughs> and it would kind of lighten the, lighten the mood a little bit, and, uh, but he, would, he was forever saying that. Um, you know, and that, with our natural eyes, that's how this Good Friday looks to us. First, three, three of Jesus' closest friends were kind of asleep at the wheel, asleep at the watch. And then another one of his trusted twelve, the one that was so trusted by the others, so well thought of and spoken of by the others, they let him take care of the money. That rascal sold him out for the price of a slave. He was arrested, and they all hightailed it out of there. Every single one of them. One of them got grabbed by his clothes and got tore it out and he left buck making. They were out of there. His closest friend, Peter, the one he had poured so much into, the one who he had chosen to be the leader of the group. And the, <coughs> most scholars think the oldest of the group, since, since he had to pay the tactics of the temple as did Jesus. He's the only one mentioned. Good chance we, he was at least 18. The others may not have been. That's just a theory. But nonetheless, God had lifted him up to the role of leader. Even Peter denied him three times, cursing him, saying, I don't know him. I don't even know him. They bowed him. They hauled him off to the corrupt religious leaders. They set up a clown court with false witnesses so they can convict him of blasphemy. blasphemy. They mocked him. They spit on him. They beat him with his fists. That ain't sound like a good day to me. They whipped him front and back, stripped him buck naked. They got done with him. He couldn't even tell who he was. I've seen some men beat. But I never said too much beat to the point you couldn't recognize. Then they nailed his body to a cross so he could suffer one of the most horrific ways to die. And this we call Good Friday. <coughs> How do you like my cheery message so far? <laughs> you know, it's no wonder that the scoffers think we're foolish. I want to tell you a story. Uh, you got this is my wife Lynn, and uh, I came down here about 40 years ago and got home with her, and soon got to meet her family. And her, uh, her dad uh, was a homeboy, like the uh, hunt and fish, mostly hunt farmer, local guy. And he's and I'm from the other side, of the Big Iron Bridge. <laughs> so shot a gun and Boy Scouts, but it. I think I killed some twitty birds. They really didn't hunt. So he was said, let's go duck hunting. I said, sure, I'll go duck hunting. So he let me use one of his guns. We went, we went down to Hempel's dock, and uh, it was so foggy, you, I, you literally, I couldn't see the front of the boat. Barely, I barely see the bow of the boat, and definitely couldn't see out past. We got in that little 15-foot wooden boat, with, and he started that up, and Lord, come down to Hempel's Dock. And I don't know if you know that area, the river, but it's uh, the channels are about this wide. And where I'm from, it's the, the deepest part, like the bay, is in the middle. And the, the shallow parts are towards the edges. Well, I hadn't been down there long enough. I didn't realize that the whole world was like that. So we're screaming around this marsh. And I'm looking straight down and saying, Hey, Matt, there's lamb right there. And he's, yeah, I know. Oh, we were flying. <laughs> so it's foggy, it's cold, it's damp. Uh, I'm ducking. So he got out to the duck line, and we put out the uh, decoys. That was fun, too. Freezing cold weather, splash, uh, water flashing on us. We get in the blind, and we're facing straight into Ocean City, straight east. And, you know, yeah, I can almost make out the skyline. Like I said, it's pretty foggy. 
Wind blowing northeast, cold, wet, and it started sleeping. And Matt said, ooh, now we're having a good day. And I said, a good day? This is a good day? Because I didn't know the rest of the story. It was a good day. I bet I shot that gun 50 times. Did it anything? Matt killed every duck that flew by. Every duck got shot at least twice. Me once, then he'd kill it. It was a good day. There was a mess of ducks that new boy got to pick up out of the cold water and put in the boat. But I got my first taste of hunting, my first taste of duck and dumplings, and indeed, it was a good day. And I got to know my father-in-law a little bit better, and he got to know me. It indeed was a good day. Amen. But when that sleep first started hitting me in the face, I didn't think that was such a good day. So, that's, I was reminded of that story this morning as I was kind of finishing this up, is, how can we call it Good Friday and not Black Friday or Holy Friday? Where does this Good Friday come from? And I heard what he said about a kind of twist on it should be God's Friday. You know, I think we call it Good Friday because we know the rest of the story. I think it's because of what Hebrews says. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it says... Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great cloud, of, so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin that so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God, excuse me, right hand of the throne of God. Yeah. You know, the first time I read that, I thought, oh, well, the joy that was set before him was uh, being able to sit down at the right hand of the throne of God. But that's not the joy that was set before him. Amen. We are the joy that was set before him. Amen. That's what makes it a good Friday. That's why Jesus said, this is a good Friday. He knew what he was doing. The enemy did not. That's why the enemy thought he had won. That's why the enemy had. That's why God let the enemy use all those people. They didn't know they were being used by God. They didn't know they were being used by the enemy. It was God's plan. It was a good Friday. We know that the rest of the story is that Jesus made a way for us to come into a right relationship with the Father. Our sin debt has been paid. Let's go ahead and clap. Yes. Thank, you. Thank you for paying that sin debt. Yes. Amen? Amen. Our, huh? There's responsibilities with it. No, we can go home. I got my ticket punched. I got my get out of jail card. I'm, I'm done. You can't live like a mm. How do we run with endurance the race that is set before us? Uh -huh. Nobody said anything worse. Certainly now that we're in right relationship with Abba, Daddy, Daddy God. That's what Abba means. It's the endearing Daddy. Now we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. Certainly now that we're in that relationship, we pray. It's hard not to be in a relationship with some of you don't talk to them. We certainly we pray. Certainly we study his word. Alone, in groups. How else will we get to know him? How else will we get to know his plan for us? So, now we'll get it through fellowship. God will use different people to speak into our lives. How do we know if it's true? The Bible says test everything. Mm -hmm. yes. Be in the Word. Certainly we pray. <clears throat> Certainly we're in the Word. 